Hey, this is Luke Story. Welcome to episode 256, which is another solo show. It's a little Q&A action. So the questions that you're going to hear in today's episode were, of course, taken from the Life Stylist Podcast Facebook group. If you'd like me to answer some of your questions in the future, the best way to have that done is by joining that group. And if I don't answer the questions in the group, one of two things will happen. Uh, some brilliant fellow listener to the podcast in the group will answer your question and probably quite uh, accurately based on what I've observed in that group. Um, or I will put that into one of my manuscripts, like the one I have in front of me, and I will answer your question on a future show. So again, join the Life Stylist Podcast Facebook group. Just search the Life Stylist Podcast on Facebook and the group will pop up. You request to join and you are in. That's it. All right. I'm going to be talking today about uh, my water practice, collecting spring water specifically, as was one of the questions uh, related to a specific spring near Lake Tahoe. And that prompted me to just do a deep dive and school people on the whole spring water thing because there's um, some degree of confusion and controversy online that I would like to address. And it's one of my favorite practices and I would love for people to be able to do that in a safe manner. So we're gonna go into that. And then we're going to cover my very favorite area of uh, biohacking, and that is hacking air travel. And this is something I've been working on for about 23 years, like making air travel not suck. In fact, I'm going to get a red hat that says make air travel great again. And I'll probably get maced by Antifa walking around Hollywood because they'll think it says the other thing. But uh, anyway, <laughs> hacking air travel is one of my passions and hobbies and also just came to be out of necessity because air travel just historically has completely wrecked me. And I love going different places. Uh, it's just that the travel itself has been quite challenging. So I said all that to say this, uh, by the end of this episode, it's highly likely you're going to want to know more about my whole water strategy. So I've created a free guide and uh, it's uh, like Luke Story's Guide to Water. You can get that. I'm just going to tell you up front by going to lukestory.com slash 129. That's lukestory.com slash 129. Or if you want to text me on a U.S. phone, only works on a U.S. phone, text one word, the water guide, that's the water guide to the number 44222. So if you want my guide to spring water, bottled water, filters, everything in the world you could ever want to know about your drinking, and for that matter, uh, home, bathing, cooking water, etc., again, go to lukestory.com forward slash 129 or text the water guide, all one word, to the number 44222. Now, when it comes to biohacking travel, as you'll hear me talk about in a few moments, uh, I'm about halfway through a, uh, an online class about biohacking travel, and that includes pre-trip, during-trip, post-trip, hotels, everything, and it's quite extensive. But due to a number of different circumstances, some of which I'll cover in a few minutes, uh, I have not completed that. However, there is a waiting list. And if you're interested in that particular online class, which is going to be really affordable, like crazy, accessible, very high value type class, not a thousand dollar, you know, master class kind of thing. Um, if you want to get on the wait list for that super easy URL here as well, you want to go to lukestory.com forward slash travel. That's lukestory.com forward slash travel. Or again, you can text me on any U.S. phone. You're going to text all one word, this word, biohack my travel. And the number again is 44222. So on a U.S. phone, text biohack my travel to 44222. That's going to put you on the wait list for the biohack my travel online class. And you'll be notified during the pre-launch. So you'll get notified before the general public does. And uh I'm really excited about doing that. I just have so many other projects that have popped up that it kind of fell through the cracks. Next week's episodes, with plural, with us, is uh, two episodes with my friend Aaron Alexander, a brilliant expert in uh, natural movement and physiology. And uh, Tuesday's first show is called The Philosophy of Physicality, a conversation with Aaron Alexander. And then there's a bonus show also released at the same time, which is a live audience Q&A during an event uh, Aaron and I hosted uh, in Malibu where 
I interviewed him in front of a live audience, and then the audience asked him questions in a Q&A format, and we recorded the whole thing, and that'll be a bonus episode next week. So next week's show is all about natural movement and how to combat the negative effects of our current sedentary lifestyles. So if you want to learn how to be in your body and be comfortable with it, you want to tune in next week. Uh, If you want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes of the Lifestylist podcast, there's a really easy way to ensure that that does not happen. It's called subscribing to this show. So I'd love for you right now to just take a pause, uh, look down at your device, app, computer, uh, whatever's producing my voice for you right now, and just find uh, the subscribe button there and just hit that. I'll be waiting for you. I'll play a little theme song while we're waiting for you to subscribe. Dun 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 dun. You done yet? Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Yes. Thank you. This way, each and every week, sometimes twice a week, my voice will magically appear from your device. And uh, you'll be getting every episode no matter what. So you don't have to, you know, think like, oh, I haven't heard that podcast in a while. What's out? It's just gonna be uploaded to your device automatically if you are subscribed. And that also helps me because it increases the number of downloads. And in the podcast game, you uh, are valued based on one thing and one thing only, and that is the number of downloads that you have. So the more people uh, that download this show, the, uh, the more of the time that increases my total number of downloads. And uh, right now I'm creeping up on 4 million, which is great. Uh, I'm super stoked on that. Uh, however, there are some podcasts out there with the bigger guys that have been around, you know, 10 years versus my three years uh, that have 150 million downloads. Now I'm going to give you a little secret. Um, those people also game the iTunes system in some cases by putting out um, multiple episodes a week that are like five, seven, ten minutes where they're just like, hey, believe in yourself today. And God bless them, they figured that shit out before I did, but that's the interesting thing about the iTunes world, and this is just some behind-the-curtain podcaster industry stuff, is no matter how long an episode is, even if it's just a trailer, if people download that, that counts as a download. So, um, you know, there's different ways to uh, measure the metric of... um, podcast downloads, but my 4 million or so um, are legit because they're all sometimes three or four hours long. Now, I don't know that makes me better than anyone else, but now I'm thinking about it like, shit, I should break a three-hour show up into 10-minute bits and I'd have 30 million downloads by now. No, um, that's just not how I do it. I've actually thought about not just as a strategy, but there's just, you know, there's something cool about if you follow a podcast and once a week they put out a little you know, micro content for you. I just, honestly, I'm too long winded. If I fire up this microphone, shit ain't happening in five to seven minutes. I, I can barely say my name in that long. Um, so even when I started these solo shows, I thought, oh, maybe there'll be 20 or 30 minutes and that didn't work. So the first one was maybe an hour and then I sit down and I'll answer two or three questions and it takes 60 to 90 minutes. So I quickly figured out that the micro episode gaming the uh, download numbers is not my game. So there you go. And not to be, again, disparaging toward the podcasters that cracked that code. God bless them. They're smart because when you can you know, give those big numbers, it increases your advertising dollars and all kinds of things like that. All right. Enough inside information. Let's get into today's show, about which I am super excited because these are two topics that I hold dear to my heart. And as I said, uh, two practices that I'm just deeply committed to and passionate about because they've improved my life so much. First question comes from a member of the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group, and she goes by the name Sarah. She says, How can you slash we justify airplane travel on an annual basis yet freak out over considerably more low level EMF from cell towers, etc.? I think airplanes are so beloved and convenient, uh, we don't give it airtime. And I don't rewrite these questions, there's as is. So sometimes as I read them, I'm like, wait, what does that mean? (laughs) Um, I'm assuming it's like sleeping on a cell tower for X amount of hours when you're on a plane. So thank you for the question, Sarah. And yeah, it's, you know, for those of us that travel, um, geez, I wish mine was on an annual basis in terms of how disruptive it is to my circadian rhythm and biology in general. I fly, I don't know, like, once a month, every couple months. 
uh, doing events and things like that. So I kind of forgot when I started um, into this industry that if I wanted to become a public speaker and a soon to be author and all the things that I'm doing that you got to get on a plane a lot. So now I'm really <laughs> coming to that realization and more committed than ever to make traveling suck less. So here you go. Uh, number one is you got to live your life. I mean, I'm I'm personally not going to sit around and be afraid of flying because it's bad for you or because it wears me out. I want to see the world. I want to see people. So the benefits of taking trips to further your career, to earn revenue, seeing loved ones and family, just interacting with and learning from other cultures around the world, uh, by far for me personally outweighs the detriments of travel itself. And yeah, travel does trash your body in many ways, but you can make it much safer by employing a few of the tricks that I'm going to lay out. And uh, as I said in the intro, someday, and honestly, I don't know when this will be. I'm just committed to doing it someday. It might be in 10 years. Who knows? Uh, I hope not. Maybe even this year, uh, my online class, Biohack My Travel, the Jet Lag Solution, will drop. I'm about halfway done with it, and um, you know it'll come out when it comes out. The difference between what I'm going to cover today and the uh, oncoming class is that in the online class, I not only cover air travel, but also auto travel and practices before and after you travel, including how to biohack your hotel room, which is like a whole thing. So there's hours and hours of content ready to go out with that class. Um, as I said, if you want to get on the wait list, go to lukestory.com forward slash travel. That's lukestory.com forward slash travel. But anyway, what happened was I was about halfway done with it. Then suddenly I had to move because I found out, as many of you are really sick of hearing about, uh, I was living under two massive cell towers and they made me really sick. It was not a good scene, so I had to flee the premises with the quickness, and that was kind of in the middle of when I was putting this class together and hoping to put it out. So, uh, you know, there you go. It'll get out when it's supposed to come out. And that's one of the reasons I was happy to see this question because it prompted me to be like, all right, I got to drop some really high value, dense, free content on the Lifestylist podcast listeners because many people got duped into joining <laughs> the wait list for that class and then it never came out. So if you're one of those people, I do apologize to get you all uh, lubed up for that one and then disappear. Um, did I just say it that way? I've never said it that way, but I guess you can read into that and um, figure out what I mean. I got y'all excited perhaps and then just ghosted. So my bad, but here you go because I'm about to provide a lot of value. Okay, so one of the main issues that many of us are concerned with on planes is the level of EMF or electromagnetic frequencies. Uh, and I've actually brought my EMF meters onto flights a few times just to check it because I'm a nut like that. And I've found that on flights that don't have Wi-Fi, the RF, meaning the radio frequencies, is actually not that high. And I've tested magnetic fields, I've tested electric fields, and to my shock and dismay and delight, I found that they weren't actually that high. However, testing them on flights with Wi-Fi is atrocious. Uh, so regardless of whether or not a plane is going to have Wi-Fi, I just employ all of the same practices on every single flight to make flying awesome. Uh, you also are subjected to uh, quite a bit of gamma radiation from the sun, which is not great because of the fact that the flights are 30, 35,000 feet closer to the sun. So you know when you're at high altitude on a ski trip and say you're at 8,000 feet, 10,000 feet, and you get smoked and sunburned because you're physically in closer proximity to the sun. Uh, well, that's kind of what happens when you're in an airplane and you're flying in a, a radiation antenna that's metal uh, in the sky. And so, you know, the EMF definitely is an issue, even though I've tested it a couple times and been pleasantly surprised that it wasn't that high. I'm still not going to bank on that because there are forms of radiation such as the gamma radiation from the sun, which are not going to show up on my little $200 meter that I got on Amazon. By the way, if you want an EMF meter, there's a couple of good ones that I recommend. Um, at lukestory.com forward slash store. Also just know that most of the things I'm going to recommend here are also readily and easily 
uh, accessible at lukestory.com forward slash store. There's even a section on there for, you know, EMFs and then another one for supplements, etc. So uh, by no means is this episode supposed to be a giant commercial uh, for my store, although that's fine if you want to use it that way too. But this is really just about educating you guys and providing value and, um, you know, whether or not you choose to buy any of this stuff or not or from my store doesn't really matter. But because these are all the things that I personally use and LukeStory.com slash store is based on and curated by everything that I use to support my health in real life, just know that you don't have to panic and, um, you know, worry that all of these knowledge bombs I'm dropping are going to be missed. Uh, you do have the opportunity to go to the store there and find some of these things. And if you're already on the email list, uh, then you would have been emailed every single link that I talk about in this episode, uh, which is very convenient for you and a really uh, valuable uh, service that I and my team at Create Media provide. So we go through each and every episode and we create hyperlinks for all of the different modalities and products and things like that that I talk about and we email them to you every week. So if you're not on the email list and you'd like to join, I highly recommend that you do. I've made it really easy to do so. Get out a browser and just go to lukestory.com forward slash newsletter and enter your name and email. And next week, you'll get an email of the episode with Aaron Alexander and all of those notes. You can also text me to get on the email list uh, by texting the word lifestylist to the number 44222 on a U.S. phone. That's one word, lifestylist to the number 44222 on a US phone and that'll put you on the newsletter so that every time I do an episode like this, you will already have the notes. So anyway, back to the task at hand. So when it comes to some of the negative uh, impact of flying, et cetera, uh, this is what I do to fix it. First thing is, uh, and I'm just gonna say, sometimes I'm gonna use the term like, I do this, sometimes I'm gonna tell you to do this, you do that and be sort of directive. Please don't take it as me preaching to you or telling you what to do or trying to do be your boss. It's just like when I write a manuscript, sometimes the verbiage comes out one way or another. Um, and that said, I am not a doctor. I you know, dropped out of high school. So you know, take my advice with a grain of salt. If you're going to undertake any kind of medical practices or procedures, please check with a medical professional. This is not legal or medical advice. I'm just telling you what I do, and I'm answering, what was her name, Sarah's question. So if anything, I'm telling Sarah what to do. Why? Because she asked me. So there you go. First thing is, if you use a laptop on the plane, you must use a Defender Shield radiation guard under it so you don't fry the hell out of your baby-making parts. You know what I'm saying? You do not ever want to use a device and have it facing your body or close to your body without blocking the radiation. Defender Shield makes great little totally affordable pads that you can put on the back of your um, you know, iPad or underneath your laptop, and they also have one for your cell phone. I have one on my cell phone right here in front of me, and I'm going to hold it up for our live stream people just to prove that I am not full of shit. I practice what I preach. I mean, really, everything I recommend, as I said before, are just things that I found to be very useful, and I love sharing them with people because I don't like people getting hurt by awesome technology. I also wear, much to the shrig, what's the word? Chagrin. Much to the chagrin of people I've traveled with in the past, uh, EMF-proof clothing, which basically means I look like tinfoil hat man when I get on a plane. It's quite a spectacle. It's embarrassing even to me to be me on a plane, as you'll soon find when I describe all of these practices. Um, but I do like to protect myself wearing EMF clothing, which I'll talk about. I take a million supplements. I have about 150 other hacks that I use when I travel. So I'm probably healthier when I'm traveling than just being at home like I am now. And in regard to Sarah's question, you know, is flying like just living on top of a cell tower? I would say living near a cell tower is hundreds of times worse than being on a plane. Uh, you can trust me because I've done both, especially if you live in a big city like I currently do. You probably live close to many cell towers. And if they're 5G, that's even worse. Uh, that being said, I don't like to get into fear mongering. My message is all about awareness. Many people don't even know what a cell tower looks like or that they're living next to one or that their laptop is going to make them infertile or, 
you know, have a miscarriage because they've been frying their uterus for 10 years, sitting there watching Netflix all night or whatever. So um, these are just kind of uh, words of a cautionary tale, but it's really important to think positively as our thoughts and emotions are really powerful. So while the same, at the same time, I, I'm an advocate for awareness around EMFs, toxins, and all of this, uh, I think that the damage done by some of these threats in our environment is multiplied um, in levels of magnitude by living in fear and anxiety. So it's that razor's edge that we have to walk of building awareness, but also staying positive and just knowing that we're safe and that there is a benevolent higher power looking out for us and that the end everything will be fine and that all we can really do is just take a few precautions and then let it go so uh, i would encourage everyone listening to keep your mind right by staying out of that limbic system trauma loop of fear and worrying you know i just went and recorded a podcast earlier today as a guest on a show called recovering from reality with alexis haynes over in West Hollywood in the Pacific Design Center. And it's really, you know, it's a great area. It's in West Hollywood. It's, it's, you know, great architecture. It's really pretty and sunny and all things LA. It's great. Uh, And I walk in the building, their office is beautiful. It's really well lit and just modern and well designed. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm happy to record here. And then I walk in the studio and I look outside and there's like a massive cell tower about, I don't know, maybe a few hundred yards, like right from the office. And we're on the ninth floor. So it's a little below us, basically just like blasting right into that. And I could see that fear response come up like, oh, my God, I'm going to this is going to hurt me. And because I had that awareness, I was able to just kind of breathe and let it go and just, you know, put a force field of, of positive energy around myself. And I've interviewed people like Joe Dispenza and Bruce Lipton, who adamantly claim that through the principles of quantum physics, we can, in fact, render ourselves at least to some degree impervious to some of the negative impacts of our environment. So let's just remember that as I go into this crazy, uh, you know, uh, list of precautions that one can take during travel. And I'd also like to say, listen, if you hear this and you're like, wow, super overwhelmed, this guy's crazy. This is just me, dog. Like I'm next level. I just, you know, I'm all out. And I've, I've, you know, been critical of myself for that. Other people have been critical of me for that in my life. And at the end of the day, I'm just like, it's 2020. I'm doing me like I'm, I, I'm hardcore. You don't have to be this hardcore. There's a few things that you can do when you fly that are going to minimize the negative impact. And I would say the number one thing you can do is just stay positive, keep um, love in your heart, keep a relaxed mind and just know that you're safe. So if you don't do any of this stuff, just work on the mindset and cultivating positive emotions in your heart and positive thoughts in your mind and you're going to be fine but if you want to experiment a bit i'm going to give you some really great uh, tips right here so first thing is uh, use quicksilver scientific melatonin on nights leading up to your flight to adjust yourself to the time zone you're going into so that you can go to sleep as close as you can to the time it is at your destination so if i you know, fly to Austin, for example, as I'm going to be in a couple months. Yay for Paleo FX. What, what? Really excited about that. Uh, April 24th through 26th or something like that. I think it is. I don't have my notes in front of me for that. Uh, But what I'll do is I'll start going to bed systematically earlier every night until I'm in that time zone. So if my normal bedtime is, you know, midnight here, which unfortunately I hate to admit it usually is, I'll make myself go to bed and go to sleep by taking this really potent quicksilver uh, scientific melatonin and I'll make myself go to bed at the time it is in Austin for at least a few days before I go. I'll also plan my meals to be in, aligned with the eating times at my destination. So I'll wake up super early and eat a massive breakfast that would be in line with the time I would eat in Austin, etc. Uh, Also using the human charger to help beat jet lag is great. That helps you adjust to time zones. The human charger is a device that uh, looks kind of like a little tiny, uh, one of those iPod minis or something, right? So if it's black and it doesn't have any music on it, it produces a specific spectrum of white slash blue light that you plug into your ears. That light shines on your brain and tells you it's noon or whatever time you're going for. So the human charger comes with an app and you 
uh, put your flight into the app and then it notifies you every time you're supposed to use the charger. So it'll start having you use it a couple days before the flight, on the flight, and after you land to adjust to the time zone. And there's a lot of research to support the efficacy of that particular device and its application to jet lag. And uh, it's amazing. There's also something very similar called the Verilite. Uh, or the V, oh yeah, no, I'm sorry, yeah, the Verilite, and that is a little full spectrum white slash blue light panel that you plug in, and that mimics sunlight. And so when I travel, I'll use that and the Juve Go, which is a little tiny, almost, I want to say pocket size because it's a little bigger than that. It's kind of the size of a thick, small book, like a Bible or something that you might find in a hotel room drawer. And uh, between the Verilite's blue light and the red light being emitted from the Juve Go, what I do when I travel is I make myself wake up at whatever time sunrise should be there. And if I can't get outside and watch the sunrise, which is, by the way, the fastest way to acclimate yourself to a different time zone, it's very difficult to do. If you go to bed tired, you arrive into you know your destination late. But if you get up and watch the sunrise, you will be adjusted to that time zone and your circadian rhythm within one, if not two days. And if you don't do anything else I talk about today when it comes to jet lag, that's the number one hack. It's not always possible to see the sunrise, however, in a hotel or wherever you're staying, and you might not wake up quite in time. So what I do with the Verilite and the Juve Go is I turn them both on and it creates uh, UV light and the different spectrum of red light that are present at dawn and in my hotel or Airbnb I'll essentially mimic for myself the sunrise and I'll sit and have that in my peripheral vision I don't like shine those lights directly in my eyes and I would advise that you don't either but I do have them on a desk while I sit there and do my work or meditate or you know make my breakfast or whatever I'm doing so those two devices are great uh, another really powerful hack, and I was just <laughs> talking to my girlfriend about this last night because we have some travel coming up, and um, I was like, you have Global Traveler, PreCheck, Clear, and all that. She's like, ah, no, I don't really care. And I was like, well, yeah, we're going to be traveling together. we got to hook this up. So having TSA PreCheck, this is for U.S. people. I don't know how it works in other countries, but in the U.S., I would highly recommend that you get TSA PreCheck, or Global Traveler and get your number and then put that into all of your flight reservations. Uh, just a technicality here because I just can't resist sharing valuable information. I've had TSA PreCheck for quite a while and it makes travel so much easier because you whiz through the lines and you're like, ha ha, you suckers over there waiting in the long line. You don't have to take your laptop out, take your shoes off, all that bullshit. You just roll through. Uh, however, once you get global traveler, which is essentially the same thing for international travel, which allows you to whiz through customs when you come back into the States, once you have your global traveler number, then your TSA pre-check becomes obsolete because your global traveler number becomes your TSA pre-check number. I just learned that because I have both. Another thing that's awesome is something called Clear, which is an independent non-governmental program that exists in most major U.S. airports uh, that allows you to just check in by scanning your fingerprints in your face and uh, just walking through security like a boss. It's freaking awesome. Uh, and my, you know, modus operandi with travel in general is to alleviate stress. And one of the most stressful things for me is just dealing with security, man. It's just... It's just brutal. I can't stand waiting in line, just the being screamed at by the screeners. And it's just like very traumatic for me. I'm fragile. <laughs> um, that said, if you're listening, you're like, I don't know. I think it's creepy for them to like have all my information and like my photo and fingerprints. It is creepy. But I'll tell you what, like right now, your phone is listening to you and recording that data and selling it to foreign governments, okay? My cell phone is on the counter and, hey, Apple, you know what? Fuck you guys. I know you're spying on me. Uh, Facebook, they've all been outed. No one stops them. It's an absolute travesty. So we don't have privacy anymore. Our data is being traded. It's being sold. We are being spied on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I am a conspiracy. What do you call it? What if it's not a theory? It's just the truth. So for me, even though I'm like, F the man, I'm not going to let the Illuminati know where I'm going. Dude, they know where you, <laughs> they know where you are, who you are. They already have your fingerprints. They already have your face um, and all of that. So to me, I'm just like, I don't know. They already got me anyway. So I'm down with the global traveler, clear and all of that. And it to me is absolutely worth it just to minimize the stress of travel and just to whiz through the lines and uh, just be badass in the way that you 
navigate that. Another thing uh, around security is I always, always opt out of the millimeter wave screening. That's that little sort of pod that you stand in and then the kind of big arms swing around you. It has, it's round and has like clear plastic. That's the same technology exactly as 5G and it's extremely dangerous. I would just recommend like, please, oh my God, especially for kids and by all means, if you're pregnant, do not ever walk through a millimeter wave scanning device or any kind of radiation producing device. It's like just not good. Uh, you can ask them and they'll tell you, oh no, it's fine, it's totally safe, but it's fake news. Uh, the great thing about having TSA, global entry, clear, etc., is you get to walk through an old school metal detector rather than being microwaved. So if, um, if I go to an airport and for any reason, this has actually never happened since I even had TSA pre-check, but if I'm ever anywhere and for some reason they want me to walk through the millimeter wave cancer box, uh, I'm just like, yo, can you just fondle me instead? Here's my body. Touch me however you want because I ain't walking through that shit. I'd rather be humiliated by, you know, someone with rubber gloves feeling me up than I would uh, walking through a radiation trap. That's just me. So I opt out. Just know that if you opt out, it takes forever. And I think they, I mean, this is me kind of speculating. I think they make it take forever so people don't opt out because it makes you late. And it's such a pain in the ass that you're just like, eh, I'm just going to walk through the cancer box. Me, I'm like, I'll sit here and wait for three hours, guys. I'm opting out. You are not putting me through that thing. And it's just, you know, it's just the principle of it, too. It's like, you're going to force me to do something that's harmful to my biology. I'm not down with that. Like, I just believe in my own sovereignty as a citizen of Earth. And um, I don't believe any government agency or otherwise should force me to do something against my own will that's going to subject my body to harm. So that's my rant on that. Also, if you can afford it, make sure to get an upgraded seat and priority boarding. Uh, you know, and of course, not everyone is in a financial position to do this. People fly coach, they're just, you know, going through a transition or their income is not where they'd like it to be. I totally get that. I've been broke as hell many times in my life, but to me, it's worth it to cut corners and other areas of spending and um, relieve the pressure of the stress of boarding the plane and sitting in a crappy, you know, center seat with no leg room, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I always recommend upgrading your seat to whatever level you can afford. Um, I personally will opt to travel less frequently and get better seats than take more trips with shittier seats. That's just me. Make sure you get up and stretch every single hour or as much as possible. Now, the flight attendants typically get pissed when you stand near the restrooms. It's kind of a security thing. Some airlines are worse than others, like Alaska Air, for example, which is how I usually fly to Mexico and Costa Rica and stuff. It's a great West Coast airline. It was formerly Virgin. So they rescanned all the Virgin planes, and now it's Alaska. So, you know, just their app works great. Their website's cool. It's just a good airline. But they have a, a, a ironclad rule that no passengers can go up and kick it up in their little coffee station by the bathroom. So what I have to do is kind of plan my stretch breaks for when they go out and do their rounds. And then I sneak up front for some plain yoga. And it's just really important for circulation and keeping your blood flow and oxygen as a result of blood flow moving through your body. You're going to look like a weirdo. People will definitely stare at you. You'll probably be the only person on the plane that gets up and keeps doing stretches and yoga and moving around like that. But um, those people are going to arrive more fatigued and more tired. And you're going to also have the um, bonus experience of moving through the discomfort of ego insecurity and self-consciousness, which to me makes it even more worth it. Next thing is make sure to buy bottled water in the airport and bring it on the plane with you. Uh, what I do is I use the Vital Reaction hydrogen tabs in my water. I do four tabs in a glass of my bottled water about every 90 minutes or so. It's got a 90-minute half-life, so uh, for antioxidant, anti-inflammation, to combat the effects of oxidative stress, which is what happens when you fly, the molecular hydrogen tabs by Vital Reaction are outstanding, and I don't know what I would do without those when I travel. Usually when you're buying water, uh, Fiji... Avion and Pellegrino are the best waters available at airports. Unfortunately, most of the time they come in a plastic bottle, which is less than ideal, but it's like 
either that or you know you're really going to take one from for the team and have to drink like some one of those tap water bottled waters like um what are they the ones um like aquafina and those ones that are made by nestle and coca-cola and pepsico and all of those uh, those waters are very suspect in my opinion so uh, i would have to be very desperate to drink those Speaking of drinking, never, ever, ever, ever drink water, coffee, or tea on airplanes. The storage tank water that they're going to serve you is incredibly toxic. Uh, I learned this from a flight attendant with many years' experience. They use very caustic chemicals to flush the tanks in between flights, and sometimes they don't flush them as often enough, and the water can become contaminated with bacteria. Not to mention it's disgusting tap water in the first place, even if it happens to be sterile. So I would personally only drink tap water if I were dying alone in the desert. Next tip is to wear earplugs even in airports. So the minute I get out of my car and Uber or however I get to an airport, I pop in my earplugs and I just bring the noise level down 70% as I check in. I mean, you got to take them out when you have to talk to you know the person giving you a boarding pass, etc., dropping off the bags. But I basically just keep earplugs in and noise canceling headphones on the entire duration of my travel experience from the time I walk in an airport onto the plane off the plane I pretty much don't I don't stop canceling noise until I'm kind of like in my hotel at my destination um, uh, noise pollution is extremely fatiguing and uh, it's very aggressive when it comes to your nervous system. So anything you can do to make your environment more quiet on a plane is really good for you. Um, many of us aren't aware of the amount of noise that takes place in flight. If you had um, a decibel meter and you took that onto a plane, you'd be shocked as to how loud it actually is. You don't really notice it because there's so much going on, but um, when I'm on flights after doing this noise canceling practice for so many years, I'm shocked when I take out my earplugs and take out my headphones and you hear this, <laughs> especially if you're sitting by one of the wings or engines or something like that. So um, I definitely recommend protecting your ears and your peace of mind. Meditate as much as possible and as often as possible when flying, also to ease stress. If you're going to listen to something, I recommend listening to uplifting podcasts like this one great podcast I know called the Lifestylist Podcast. Uh, also, spiritual audiobooks and guided meditations and things like that are great to keep your nervous system in rest mode. I use something called New Calm, which is a, a particular sort of mod, uh, meditation modality involving um, neuroacoustics and a little sticker that helps you produce, uh, um, uh, what's it called, GABA, and really relax you. Uh, I use that constantly when I fly. I've got a show coming up on that very soon, so you'll know what the new calm is all about. Next thing is to sleep as, sleep as much as humanly possible on flights to preserve your energy. So it's all about meditating and napping. I know a lot of people like to get on a work and just on a plane and crush work and just dominate on a laptop. And every once in a while, if I take some modafinil, I'll just go nuts and get a lot of work done. And that's great too. Just know that it's taking a toll on your energy reserves uh, by just having you pay attention to something and burn energy with your brain doing creative work or focus work. So whenever possible, unless I you know, really am feeling inspired and want to take advantage of that solitude and time where I can focus on some work, I really do basically meditate and sleep the entire time I'm flying. You also want to wear blue blocking glasses the entire time you're on planes. Now, if it's daytime when you're flying, then wear some clear blue blockers by someone like Raw Optics or Blue Blocks, two of my fantastic sponsors. Um, while I'm on that note, people are sometimes, I think, confused because I have two different show sponsors that sell essentially the same product. And so, of course, everyone's like, what's better, Raw Optics or Blue Blocks? I'm just going to tell you this straight up. Uh, and you know, I got to look at their prices. They might even have a different price point. I forget if there's a difference there, but um, the technology that both of those companies are using, as far as I can tell, is the same, meaning they both uh, block certain frequencies of blue light and they do it well. Really what you're looking at between those two companies is just different style frames. It's like, what glasses do you like and do you want to wear? You know, um, so... I, I wear and like them both. I'm I'm totally not biased toward either one. So just a matter of like looking at their websites and finding the frames that you dig. Um, so in the daytime, wear some clear blue blockers and everything looks pretty normal to you, but they do cut out that really bad spectrum of light. Now, if it's nighttime, 
especially if it's nighttime at your destination. So let's say, again, I'm flying from uh, New York to Austin and I leave at five in the afternoon. That means it's already seven in Austin. The sun's going down. So right when I get on that plane, I'm going to put on the super dark, true dark wraparound glasses. Now, these are not the coolest looking blue blockers in the world. And no offense to my friends at True Dark. I'm sure they're aware of this. If you wear like the raw optics or blue blocks, you don't look that weird because the frames are stylish. You know what I mean? The True Dark glasses, though, they wrap around your face and you're going to look like Lane Staney. What's his name from um, <laughs> that 90s grunge band? God, I hated grunge. And also their fashion was fucking horrific. Anyway, another topic. But you're going to you're gonna look like a douche, okay, um, wearing the true dark glasses. And, you know, to me that's worth it. It's called taking one for the team to feel better upon arrival. But, again, the trick there is really paying attention to when sunset is at your destination and make sunset happen for you on the plane even though you're not in that time zone yet. It's another way to trick your circadian rhythm into a different time zone and it will change your freaking life um also remember that i'm like getting i need to i never bring a glass of water in here when i do these solo shows and i always regret it someday i will learn the lesson i get kind of parched uh remember that all indoor lighting is junk lighting There is no such thing as natural lighting if you are behind glass. The only natural lighting that exists in the known universe is the lighting that you experience when you are outdoors. So all light coming through glass, as it is on a plane, glass and or plastic, is artificial fake blue light, meaning that that spectrum of light has been processed in a way that no longer makes it natural and it becomes what's called non-native or NN blue light. And that's very confusing to your brain, your biology, your circadian rhythm. And it's also really bad for your eyes. And uh, additionally, not only the light coming in that's fake light because it's been filtered, uh, you also have the seat-mounted TVs and all the devices around you that are emitting tons of toxic blue light as well. So when flying, do yourself a favor and block that blue light. For EMF, I always bring my um, my Blue Shield cube and my Soma Vedic travel unit to create an uh, you know a harm a harmo- what am I looking for a harmonious energetic zone around you and your seat. You'll be doing your neighbors a favor as well. I also use those when I drive. Uh, if you don't want to be that hardcore, or spend that much money. Blue Shield makes a really cool little pocket model that creates a scalar wave field around your body while you fly. It actually goes out in a radius of six feet, so it's going to blast people on either side of you as well. They won't know it, but you'll be doing them a huge favor to help mitigate some of the uh, negative effects of the EMF on the plane. As I said, make sure to do dusk and dawn sun gazing to adjust to the time zones you're coming from and going to. Aside from all of this stuff, when it comes to jet lag, that is the number one thing you can do to adjust quickly. I like to do cryotherapy or ice baths, uh, also vitamin IVs, uh, a Myers cocktail or something of that nature, or even an NAD IV. Uh, which is fuel for your mitochondria before and after travel. Those are great recovery tools. Also, hyperbaric oxygen chamber treatments before and after will change your life because what do they do? They flood your blood plasma with oxygen, which in some cases lasts lasts for a couple hours. So um, now I have one of those at home. Thank God I finally bit the bullet and dropped a a lot of money (laughs) to have my own hyperbaric chamber at home because I'm working on some brain health and uh, recovering from a TBI, et cetera. So, well, I guess like TBI in general, not like one, but just living life is a TBI for me. Uh, But I'm super stoked to have that chamber now that I travel because I used to go do sessions at a business. Like there's a place in LA on Sunset Boulevard called Next Health. If you live in the city, I'd recommend that you do your hyperbaric there. Their chamber is beautiful and very effective. Also, getting an ozone IV or just doing what I do at home is I use my ozone generator and I will do, um, well, there's a number of different ways you can get ozone gas into your body. You can put it up your, or you can put it in your ears. You can, uh, if you're a female, you can put it in your frontal orifice. Uh, There's a lot of ways you can get the ozone in your body, and that's great because one of the things that ozone does, in addition to being really good at killing pathogens, et cetera, 
is it assists your body in uh, increasing your oxygen utilization. And of course, when you're going into a very low oxygen environment, such as a plane, that's really useful. So I'm a big fan of the ozone, uh, again, before and after flying. Also using the Juve Red Light Therapy to help with mitochondria and inflammation. And as I said, the little Juve Go model is also great for uh, hacking time zones and creating kind of a fake sunset for yourself. Also, as I said, using the EMF-proof clothing is great, especially a beanie to protect your brain. And also, of course, Lamb's EMF-proof underwear that I wear exclusively in life no matter what I'm doing. But those are great to wear on the plane. And then when it comes to the disgusting germy air quality on the plane, which is not only typically very low oxygen, but also full of pathogens, one thing you can do is periodically huff essential oils to kill the germs. There's one called On Guard made by doTERRA that kills just about every bug on contact. So I'll put a few drops of that on my hands and kind of rub my hands together, kill all the funk on my hands. Then I'll take my hands up to my nose with that On Guard and I'll kind of literally do deep inhaling of those oils and even trace amount of those oils in your uh, nasal passage will kill pathogens. So that's a really great thing to travel with. And after you visit the bathroom, of course, you're going to wash your hands profusely the whole flight. But when you get out of the bathroom, you probably had to touch something and just everything, you know, around your seat and everything on planes is just disgusting. Like if you took a uh, one of those, you know, um, black lights on the plane and looked for funk, uh, you would be disgusted. Uh, so on guard, essential oil by doTERRA is really good to have. You can also get little portable air filters that are battery powered. You can hang around your neck that produce negative ions. Some of them make ozone. Some of them just clean the air around your personal space. I think I have one of those on thelukestory.com forward slash store site also. Uh, then one thing I like to do is buy some tiny little compressed oxygen canisters and I huff them when no flight attendants are looking when I'm on the plane to get up my blood oxygen levels. Now, TSA hates them, and technically they're illegal, so I'm not advising that you bring them on planes. Uh, I just heard, you know, like my cousin used to do that, and he loved it. Uh, no, but seriously, yeah, you're not supposed to take them on. I've only had mine taken away once, though, so enter at your own risk with that technicality in terms of contraband on an airplane. Next thing is to do breath work. I love to get to the airport a little early and do some you know, rounds of breath work, whether it be one of my kundalini yoga practices or some Wim Hof action, but I want to get oxygen in my blood. I want to get moving. I'm going to take my shoes and socks off, get barefoot. If there's any sun around, I'm going to rip my shirt off and just be that freak at the airport that's grounding in the sun doing breath work because that is a huge, huge benefit when it comes to the negative effects of flying. Now, when it comes to grounding, you can also ground on a plane. You can keep your bare feet on the metal frame of the seat in front of you, or you can also plug a grounding strap into the actual outlet at your seat. Now, some people I've interviewed that are quite brilliant, I think I asked Jack Cruz about this and some other people, they think it's really stupid and insane to use a metal wire to ground yourself to the airplane. Um, some people recommend doing the barefoot thing. I don't really know. I do both. I don't care. I'm just, I want to be grounded because of the uh, effect of static electricity that builds up on a plane, just as it does when you're in a car driving fast. Um, planes even have an anti-static strap hanging off the back of the plane for that very reason, to minimize the static electricity built up from traveling so quickly through space and time. So I'm a fan of grounding on the plane. I also recommend staying in ketosis before, during, and after flights by water fasting or just going completely carb and sugar-free uh, on the days that you fly. There's another way to hack that. Uh, my favorite supplement company, Quicksilver Scientific, makes a great product called Keto Before 6 that makes it super easy to produce ketones and stay in ketosis. And if you don't know what keto is or ketosis is, you might have seen some product in Whole Foods and you're like, what's this keto thing? Basically what that means is just that your body is getting fuel from fat, which is called ketones, rather than fuel from sugar, which is called glucose. Um, it's really difficult to not have a very inflamed body when you fly 
if you're living on uh, key, to, um, I'm sorry, on glucose for energy. So the idea there with the ketosis while flying is to reduce inflammation, and inflammation is inherent to air travel. I also megadose Quicksilver Scientific liposomal glutathione before, during, and after a flight to help with the oxidative stress. It's a master antioxidant that your body produces from some of the foods that you eat, but I like to get extra glutathione in there while I'm traveling. I'll also bring some small travel bottles of the Bulletproof Brain Octane Oil, which is uh, really great for uh, making ketones. It's a really healthy fat that fills you up and keeps food cravings at bay and makes it easier to stay on a fat and protein only kind of situation. I'll also bring the Biomat and or the Therisage heating pads to keep uh, the, the back pain and inflammation down when I'm flying. I use compression clothing, uh, typically a shirt, and always, always I'm flying with my Comrade compression socks. After you land, it's really good to find a natural body of water and get into it as soon as possible, whether that be a hot tub, swimming pool, lake, river, ocean, sea. It's a great way to ground your body. I also like to take an ice bath and a hot bath and a sauna as soon as possible. One of the great ways to do this is to find a Russian spa. You can find one of those in most cities. Editor, uh, give me oh, whoa. <clears throat> give me an edit right in there. I just had to step up and take care of something. Another great hack is to, oh, you know what? I'm going to do a screen grab for my editor so I can tell them right where this edit is. Okay, there we go. We're back in. Another great hack in terms of static electricity and grounding is to get to your hotel or wherever you're staying and run a hair dryer all over your entire body just with your clothes on. Uh, that is a really great way to neutralize the static electricity that builds up during air travel. And now I'd like to break down some of my favorite travel supplements. So get ready for this one. I can't believe we're already at 51 minutes as I record this. I, 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 did, I had no idea that I was going to create such an epic um, solo show, but I guess I'm covering two topics that are quite dense. So supplements, here we go. I'm not going to go into them too much in the interest of time. As I said, you can look at the show notes and get all the links to the products that I recommend, whether they're on my site or some other site where I get mine. The first one is not available yet on my site because it's, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit, it, it, the legality of this one is uh, somewhat nebulous. It's legal, but you kind of have to buy it with Bitcoin. It's just a little funky, and that's something called uh, Kratom is what it's called in Thailand and Southeast Asia. People in uh, the U.S. Westerners call it Kratom or Kratom. This is a natural painkiller that is essentially just a ground-up leaf from Southeast Asia. It acts on your brain as an opiate would uh, and is really great for relaxing your nervous system and killing pain. So if you've ever taken something like a Vicodin or an Oxycontin or um, something of that nature. If you take enough Kratom or Kratom, uh, it works like that. And I'd also like to give you the warning, the caveat that from what I understand, the Kratom is potentially addictive. Uh, I've never had that problem, and which is shocking because I do have a history of opiate abuse uh, in my very distant past. Thankfully, I've moved on from that. And I use Kratom on a, I don't know, probably two or three days a week. I've never felt withdrawal symptoms. I've never felt cravings for it. I've never obsessed about it. I don't freak out if I don't have it. It's, I don't know, I definitely do not feel addicted to it. Uh, however, I am conscious about the way in which I use it because I don't want to ruin it for myself and become addicted and not be able to do it anymore because it's freaking awesome. So I bring some uh, Kratom capsules in my little um, supplement case and I'll take a couple of those, you know, during the flight, before the flight, and it just really helps my body with the pain that I tend to get from sitting for long periods of time, even when I'm getting up and moving and stretching. I'll use qualia for alertness and focus, typically toward the end of a flight, just to wake my ass up, getting ready to land and kind of activate. Uh, the next one's modafinil, which is a pharmaceutical that you do need a prescription for unless you know how to work your way around the dark web and order it with Bitcoin from shady companies in India, et cetera, which is what I do. I don't know that I'll have a link for you guys for that one because these companies move around a lot. They're difficult to keep track of. Uh, it's not something I can sell on my website because, you know, just it's weird. 
Uh, but that's my number one jet lag supplement due to its ability to erase sleep debt so powerfully. I mean, this shit is strong. It's not a stimulant like um, crystal meth or um, what's that one? Adderall. It works differently on your brain. But one thing it's really good at is making you not tired anymore when you're tired. However, I'll take modafinil. Uh, maybe toward the end of a flight, so I'm really awake and alert by the time I land, and I'll just take a nap. So it's not speed, although it has some of the same qualities in that it allows you to really focus for long periods of time and definitely allows you to become awake when you want to be uh, just by popping a quarter or half of one of those. I very rarely take a full tablet of modafinil, which would be 200 milligrams, because for my brain, that would be overstimulating. However, I have shared these little magic pills with friends over the years, and for some people, they take a whole one, and they don't feel anything, so they take two, and they're like, I think I feel something. I would probably be like, I don't know, you know, like scrubbing the bathroom down if I took for all night or something, you know, like taking a radio apart and putting it back together. You know what I'm saying? You tweakers out there, shout out to my tweakers. Uh, that's why I don't need a lot of modafinil. I'm very sensitive to it. A quarter does me fine, but it is very powerful um, for making up for a lack of sleep that sometimes happens when we travel. Next one is Natural Stacks MagTech Magnesium Supplement. I mega dose this to combat stress of course, help with sleep and help protect against EMF due to the calcium channel, blah, 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 geeky science shit uh, around what EMFs do to you. It's really good to have a high magnesium uh, level when it comes to being in a high EMF environment. You can look up the work of Dr. Joseph Mercola to support that. I also like to add mega hydrate to my water to increase the hydration level and kind of structure and wetness of water. Uh, that is a silicate-based product invented by Patrick Flanagan that is quite amazing and very useful not only for hydration but also for combating the negative impact of oxidative stress, as are most of the recommendations I'm giving you here. Uh, however, caveat here, don't use Mega Hydrate and the... Um, the hydrogen tablets at the same time, because if you have mega hydrate in the water, it stops the hydrogen tabs from working. It's weird. I have no idea why, but I try to combine them and it doesn't work because they, they negate each other. So use them separately, but I would recommend using both of them during travel. Liquid chlorophyll is also awesome to drop some of that into your water. It's got tons of bioavailable copper, which also helps with the radiation exposure as does the supplement called Oceans Alive Marine Phytoplankton, which I believe I have on my site. That's an amazing substance made from that phytoplankton in the sea. Uh, it's highly purified and safe and doesn't have weird plastics and all that. The reason it's rad is because it's very high in something called SOD or super oxide dismutase, which is a very powerful antioxidant, not unlike glutathione. So taking those in high doses together is really great for inflammation and oxidative stress. I'll also bring my Four Sigmatic Instant Coffee, those little packets on the plane. I'll make myself some coffee because goddamn, I ain't drinking the coffee they're serving on the plane with their disgusting tap water. And that also helps with ketosis and fasting. Uh, if I feel really acidic and kind of nasty, I'll bust out some of my Organifi green juice packets and put those in my water bottle for alkalinity. Another great supplement is uh, astaxanthin capsules by Nutrex. This helps to protect you from UV exposure while flying and traveling. It's like, um, it could be described as an internal sunscreen. It's also great for people outside of the plane that have fair skin and are afraid to get burned and want to acclimate yourself to the sun by building a solar callus. Astaxanthin is incredible for um, quickly helping you acclimate to sun exposure, especially when traveling. So if you live in North Dakota and you're like, woohoo, I'm going to the Bahamas, dude, you want to have some astaxanthin there to help with sunburns. You don't apply it topically you take it internally and um, in some magical way, which I don't completely understand, uh, it helps your body to withstand a lot of powerful UV or ultraviolet light exposure from the sun. 
Another Rockstar supplement is Unfair Advantage by Bulletproof. This has PQQ and CoQ10, which help to fuel your mitochondria. Why I like the Unfair Advantage product here is that they come in little ampules that do not need to be refrigerated in order to be preserved. Uh, they're not that friendly on the environment because it's a little plastic thing, and there's 12 little plastic things in a box, and I don't really like that part of it, but... Um, I just don't like little shit that comes in little plastic things that you throw away, but what are you going to do? It's either me or them, you know what I'm saying? But uh, it's really great for just giving you energy without being stimulated. Another product that I love, and I probably love more even than the Bulletproof one that has the same basic ingredient profile is called The One. And The One is made by Quicksilver Scientific, and um, it's one of my top two energy supplements. But the thing is with the Quicksilver Scientific, The One, and also their glutathione, is they only last for a number of hours outside of refrigeration. Um, well, if it's cold, wherever you are, they're going to last longer. But if it's hot, they eventually lose their potency, as I understand it. So those ones are a little tricky to travel with, which is one of the reasons I love the Unfair Advantage ampules from Bulletproof. Uh, when I need energy because they're very travel friendly. Same goes for my all-time energy, all-time favorite energy supplement that just came out from Quicksilver. It's called NAD Plus. It's freaking insane, dude. It's an NAD precursor that is incredible for stress recovery and fatigue. And just look it up. Watch Dr. Chris Shade's videos on this and it will all make sense. But essentially this I believe, and you know, the real biohackers and geeks are going to be like, you don't know what you're talking about. But I think the way NAD works is that it helps you to produce more ATP, which is the energy that you use to live your life. All I know is when I do about two to four squirts of that Quicksilver NAD Plus under my tongue, dude, I have so much goddamn energy. It's ridiculous. It's by far my favorite energy supplement because it's one of the only ones that actually works. Next is Paracetam, which is a nootropic I use a lot for flying because of its ability to increase oxygen levels in the brain by increasing blood flow. Same goes for Blue Canatine by Trescriptions. Those of you that heard Dr. Ted Achacoso or Dr. Ted, uh, Scott Share previously on my show will have heard me talk a lot about that. I take these little things all the time. Uh, they are called a trochee, which is a little tablet that you put between your cheek and gum. And that allows you to kind of get a slow drip of methylene blue, which is a neuroprotective compound. It's just absolutely fascinating, amazing um, substance for your brain. It also has some nicotine, CBD, and caffeine. It's incredible for travel due to its neural protective qualities. It's freaking awesome. And it's also um, turns your tongue bright, bright blue, which is <laughs> always uh, entertaining because when you talk to people, you can see them staring at your blue mouth. Lastly, I also like to take uh, fish oil or some cod liver oil, cod liver oil, uh, while traveling to help thin the blood and, as a result, of course, increase circulation. My favorite cod liver oil is called, I believe it's called Rosita. Uh, it's from Norway or somewhere up there, and I, I did a deep dive research into that and found that they are sustainably harvested. It doesn't go bad. You don't have to refrigerate it. It's not rancid. It's um, screened and tested and purified for any uh, trace contamination in the sea. And it's just freaking awesome. And it's full of uh, naturally occurring and bioavailable vitamin D, vitamin A, and also, as I said, really good for thinning your blood when flying, which is really kind of um, a great way to complement the compression clothing. So you're thinning the blood and you're reducing the, you know, the inflammation and puffiness that happens when you're in um, kind of a low pressure, low oxygen environment. So my main goals when flying really have to do with reducing inflammation and staying hydrated. And all of those supplements and practices that I just described are really great ways to do that. Wow, it's already been an hour, and we've only covered the first question now. I think the second one's going to be a bit shorter. So uh, if you want to know about how to build a spring water strategy, listen up, because I'm about to drop uh, some pretty great knowledge on you. This next question comes from Gabriella. 
She says, hey, everybody, I just moved to Lake Tahoe, and I'm wondering if anyone knows a good spring to get drinking water from in the area. Thanks for your help. Well, you know what? I got your back, Gabriella, and thanks for your help in populating the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group and creating some great energy in there. Uh, the spring that I go to when I'm in the Lake Tahoe area is called Boca Springs, B-O-C-A, as in mouth in Spanish. Cerrado tu boca. Shut your mouth, as we sometimes say when someone's being annoying and only speaks Spanish. <laughs> you can find Boca Springs on findaspring.com. That's findaspring.com, which incidentally is where you can find springs of a hot and cold nature all over the world. My friend Chris owns that site. It used to belong to Daniel Vitalis, and it is a resource that has added so much to my life because I've used that site to find spring water all over the U.S. Um, on many different trips, and it's user-generated, user-supported. It's free. It's freaking awesome. That said, uh, for you, Gabriella, up there in the Tahoe area, I would definitely have that water tested. I'm going to tell you how, because last time I was there collecting that water, one of the rangers told me that it was tainted. Now, I drank about 30 gallons of it after I was told that, and here I am feeling pretty lit. So, uh, you know, uh, the cautionary tale might not be that valid because I survived it. But um, as with any water you find in nature, I truly do recommend that you get your water tested if you're going to drink it on a regular basis, especially if it's like the water that you're going to be collecting in your environment and drinking in your home, which I think is the number one best practice you can have with water if the water in your area is awesome spring water and I'll tell you in a moment how to find out whether it is. Uh, so if you want to test your water it's a really easy to remember website here go to watercheck.com that's watercheck.com and you're going to get instructions on how to collect a sample you're going to send in a sample and they will send you the report on your water which is going to be very thorough they have a few different tiers I would go for the most expensive test you're probably looking at. Don't quote me on this. I'm just taking a wild guess uh, based on observing their site periodically. Maybe 350 bucks or something like that. If it's a spring that you want to go to on an ongoing basis, to me it's totally worth it. But they're going to test for heavy metals, for bacteria, for acid rain, for everything that you don't want in your drinking water. Again, I'm going to um, take you back to my offer earlier. If you want my personal guide to water, which is all things spring water, what to look for, how to get it, all the bottled water that I prefer in a hierarch uh, hi hierarchical, is that the word, hierarchical order, um, and everything you could ever want to know about water, here's what you do. You can get my guide for free. Go to lukestory.com forward slash 129. That's the free water guide. It's a massive PDF that's going to teach you everything I know about water above and beyond what I'm about to share here. It's free, and you can find it at lukestory.com forward slash 129. You can also text the word, the water guide, all one word, the water guide, to the number 44222 on any U.S. phone, and you'll get that same PDF. Additionally, if you want to like go for a deep dive, no pun intended, on the water here, You'll also find about seven hours worth of content all about drinking and bathing water uh, on episodes 129, 130, and 131. It's a trilogy series I did a couple years ago called The Water Wars featuring Daniel Vitalis and my friend Chris from Live Spring Water, um, as well as da, 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 Seth from, uh, God damn it, what's his spring called? Is it Opal's? No. Oh, my God. They're on the East Coast. Forgive me, Seth, if you ever hear this and I don't remember the name of your company. It'll come to me eventually. Maybe not. Maybe now is not the time. Should have taken more press time before I recorded. My bad, Seth. But you can find out what that company was by going to episodes 129, 130, and 131, the Water Wars Trilogy. On with today's show. It's really important that you understand the difference between a real spring and a creek or a stream or a river or something like that. Never, ever, ever, please listen to me now, please, 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 never drink water from a body of water that is above ground. So I don't care if you're 12,000 feet up in the Himalayas and you find a little stream coming down the hill and it looks clean and smells clean and is cold and beautiful. Chances are that some animals have shat in that water up above where you are and um, 
left their mark in the form of some really dangerous uh, dangerous pathogens, bacteria, etc. So spring water in its truest source uh, should always be collected directly from uh, where it pops out of the mountain, which is usually a pipe or something like that that's been placed there by people who uh, regularly use the spring. In fact, there's a great spring up uh, on the side of the highway going up to Big Bear outside of Los Angeles. It's on findaspring.com. Don't DM me and ask me for the coordinates. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to find. Uh, but when I went there last a couple years ago, there was no pipe. I just saw like this water kind of draining out of the side of the hill. And I'm an experienced spring water hunter, and uh, I, I knew a friend who had collected water there for many years, but the pipe had just gotten buried by um, avalanche, essentially, of just you know debris and rocks and earth coming down off the hill after snowfall melts every year and burying the old, old pipe, but now there's just kind of water just trickling out, and so... We went to Home Depot and bought some pipes and kind of rammed them into the side of the hill, and then now you have a spring. But I just you know, want to emphasize that, that water that is on the surface of the earth is very much prone to contamination, and that is not a spring. A spring is where the water comes out. It's called the, um, what's it called? The headwaters of a spring is what it's called. In fact, if you go up to the town of Shasta at the foot of... Mount Shasta in California, a very beautiful area to follow, you will find the headwaters of the Sacramento River, which is a massive, massive gaping hole in a rock that is like one minute it's a rock, the next minute it's a freaking river, and that's the headwaters of a spring. Um, and it's the headwaters, as I said, of the uh, uh, Sacra I think, is it the Sac yeah, Sacramento River, and it eventually ends up in the San Francisco Bay. But you can go there and drink from that water all day long because that water has not been above ground. So springs must be collected from the source. Okay, if you go into an area and you don't have access to findaspring.com or you can't find one there, uh, a way you can find a spring in most cases is by going to the local mom and pop health food store and just asking the most hippie looking person there, like, hey, is there a local spring around here that's safe to drink from? They'll probably know. I've done this tons of times. People that live close to the earth, crunchy kind of folks, granola folks, they're down with springs and will likely be able to direct you to one. Uh, just know that they're very hard to find. The directions always suck. It's like, go down Highway 80 and then turn right at the cow pie. And when you see the crow in the pine tree on your left at about 150 feet, take a right. You know, it's like that. You're like, really, dude? Like, can't, do you have GPS? <laughs> you know? Um, so just be forewarned. I've been on a lot of failed spring water hunts, even from findaspring.com, because it's, as I said, user generated. And oftentimes people aren't, you know, their their level of topographic skill is um, leaving a bit to be desired. So your directions even on there sometimes are like, what? Where is it? It just says it's right here in the bushes. No, it's not. I just had this happen in uh, Basalt, Colorado with my, my friend and the... Um, the uh, moderator of all of my Facebook pages, we went to find a spring and we couldn't find it based on findaspring.com and we just kept at it and we finally asked someone and they were like, oh, it's right up there. We missed it by 100 yards just because the directions sucked ass. Uh, but once we found it, it was cold, delicious, clean, amazing, beautiful. And I'm sure he and his lovely wife are drinking it right now as we speak. Next thing, uh, my friend Chris, as I said, who's the owner of um, findaspring.com, also owns an amazing company where I personally get my drinking water at home, and I wish I goddamn had some right now because I'm so parched. Uh, his site's called livespringwater.com, and that's where I get my water. And uh, unfortunately for you that live outside of California, they are not yet available in your area, but that is true live spring water, meaning it's not been adulterated or processed by mankind in any way, which if you have water like live spring water that's been lab tested with great scrutiny uh, is the best water you can get. It's water that's untouched, but also has been tested and proven to be safe and have also what's uh, known as a low TDS or total dissolved solids. And you can learn all about that on episode 129, 130, and 131. You want water essentially that's low mineral because the water uh, that contains minerals contains minerals that are inorganic, meaning your body can't absorb those minerals because they are still in the form of ground up rock. 
So you need plants or animals to take those minerals and make them bioavailable. So you want a low TDS spring water, and live spring water is very low TDS, and it's completely safe. Uh, back to my friend Chris, um, who used to be called Mukunde, but I just saw on his Instagram that it's he says Chris now, I think. So I'm just going to go with Chris. You know how it is. You pick up a spiritual name, and years later, maybe he's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going back to Chris. Whatever the case may be, I support it. You can call me whatever I want. Just don't call me late for dinner. Chris uh, once showed me a spring right here up the street from my house in Laurel Canyon in the Hollywood Hills up on Mulholland Drive. And uh, we went and drank a bunch of that water, collected it. I'll be honest, that spring looked very suspect. We were drinking from the headwaters right at the, you know, the source of the spring. But it was quite muddy. <laughs> Pretty shady looking around there, um, but, you know, I'm willing to take one for the team to learn. We did, in fact, uh, subsequently have that water tested by watercheck.com, and it came back with, um, you know, uh, some traces of not-so-awesome bacteria. So please be careful and use discernment, but in general, springs are safe, and especially if you're going to, you know, just order live spring water to your house as I do. Uh, the best spring water usually comes from very high altitude springs and also uh, mountains that are very rocky. And the reason for that is because the amount of filtration that takes place from a high altitude spring versus a low altitude spring. So let's say you have an aquifer at 500 feet above sea level somewhere in California or Arizona or wherever, right? Well, that water has only traveled 500 feet through filter medium coming from an aquifer below, whereas spring water that's harvested from, say, 10,000 feet has come from below the mountain at ground level and traveled from aquifers beneath the mountain all the way up, almost magically, through that 10,000 feet of bedrock to the surface. So if you think about you know, a filter that you have like a Berkey or something like that in your home, what does it have in terms of filtration material? Maybe 10 inches? Try 10,000 feet. Another reason that Rocky Mountains are better than Sandy Mountains is because uh, when that water travels through hard rock, like a granite, etc., it picks up a lot less minerals that get eroded into the water as it travels through its various veins inside the mountain to arrive at the fountainhead or the head of the spring. So if you have a mountain that is limestone or sandstone, etc., those rocks are softer and thus erode faster and put minerals that you don't want in your body in the water, creating a water that's very high in TDS or total dissolved solids. So the higher altitude and the rockier the mountains, the better spring water you're going to get because of less minerals, more filtration, more cleanliness, etc. Speaking of cleanliness uh, and the, you know, the safety profile or just the preference of, you know, a filtered tap water versus spring water, etc. There are some quite delusional conspiracy theorists online, sort of this, the troll types that will tell you that all springs in the world are toxic because they are polluted with acid rain and chemicals and that they're going to kill you if you drink them. Uh, that the whole you know world is contaminated in this sort of doomsday apocalypse kind of vibe. And let me tell you, in most cases... It's a million times safer uh, <laughs> to drink high altitude tested spring water than it would be to drink any of your commercial soups, kombucha, beer, wine, sodas, any drinks at all that are made from tap water, filtered or not, including most of the cheap bottled water, uh, much of which has turned out to be just tap water that's been purified and labeled as spring water. Uh, the foremost anti-spring hater out there um, kind of uses scare tactics to keep people away from collecting this nectar of the gods as I see true, pure, clean spring water. And personally, I think it's probably because he likes to collect commission checks for the filters that he promotes. Now, I'll say that with this fact that all of us influencers, absolutely myself included in the health and wellness space, uh, we make affiliate commissions on things that we recommend. And many of the things that I recommended in this very podcast, if you go buy it from my site, I'm going to get a commission and I'm stoked. And I have no bones about that because I work my ass off to produce this content. In fact, I'm about an hour and 18 into this particular podcast right now. Last night, I spent about three hours uh, preparing the manuscript for this. 
So, you know, if I make 10 bucks because you go buy one of these vitamins or something, cool. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Um, however, I think that um, in a situation where people are getting affiliate commissions and stuff uh, and everyone wins, meaning the producer of the content, making the recommendations, the brands that are making great products and the consumer because they get, you know, a vetted product recommendation and in most cases a discount. I think it's a really great tra transaction, but it's unfortunate that some people in my space do use hate and fear tactics and misinformation just to make a sale. And maybe it's what they truly believe, that they literally believe that all water on the planet is contaminated. Uh, I would just like to point out, though, that uh, if you look at how many millions or maybe I meant to look this up, like how long has the earth been here? Um, let's just say I, don't, I really don't know the answer, but let's just say millions of years, right? So for millions of years, there's been water inside of the earth underneath the surface. Uh, much of that water has never been on the surface. And then a couple hundred years ago, into that millions of years, the Industrial Revolution happened where we started polluting the water with chemicals and uh, you know nuclear runoff from nuclear weapon testing and acid rain uh, from the coal plants and... Uh, fluoride and pharmaceuticals getting into the water supply and Roundup, glyphosate, pesticides, all of the nasty, nasty shit that ends up in our water. Do you really think that in a couple hundred years, all of the water on the surface and underneath the surface of the earth could be polluted after it's been there for millions and millions of years? To me, that just does not make sense if you do the math and you kind of zoom out and look at the great expanse of time uh, <laughs> with which the planet has been producing water from under the surface and drawing it forward. So that's kind of my take on that. And some spring water is so old that it's never been on the surface of the earth and is therefore inherently free of toxins and acid rain and all those things that people will have you be afraid of. And I'll also say that obviously I have no incentive in getting you to go drink spring water. In fact, it would benefit me more to recommend uh, water filters to you that you go buy and I get a commission from. And I'm going to drop a couple of those for you that don't live by a spring. Because if I lived, you know, if I decide to move to Bali or Costa Rica or somewhere where there's swag spring water if any i'm definitely getting a filter because my ass is not gonna you know drink shitty bottled water or you know tap water so filters are great but it's free to go collect spring water and to me it's the best water on the planet and the best spring water and the ones that are definitely free of contamination because i've had them tested personally at the most scrutinizing lab in the world uh, is called primary water. And this is water that has never touched the surface of the earth. And you can Google that. Do some research. It's called primary water. It's a scientifically proven valid phenomenon in nature where this water has not only never touched the surface of the earth, it's actually been created by the earth before the Industrial Revolution is therefore free of all contamination. Do you get what I'm saying here? The earth makes water. You know how there's oil, like crude oil under the surface of the earth, there's also water like that. And this is water that's new water that's never been up here before. And most springs, especially the ones that are very high altitude, are also going to be producing water that's thousands of years old, meaning it's gone through the hydrological cycle where it's gone from being rain, sleet, or snow into uh, lakes, streams, rivers, etc., ends up in the ocean, becomes precipitation, goes up into clouds, becomes rain, sleet, and snow again, drops on the land, goes back into the rivers, streams, brooks, lakes, etc., and so on. Much of that water that's dropped by clouds onto the mountains seeps into the land and goes into what are called aquifers, which are sort of underground reservoirs or lakes of water that then um, can either be manually tapped, as I'm going to explain, or produce enough hydrological pressure uh, to produce a spring where that water is brought back up to the surface of the earth. When you're dealing with uh, water that has been through the hydrological cycle and has not been on the surface of the earth in five or 10,000 years, 
not only is that water being filtered by 10 or even 5,000 feet of filter material as it moves up through the earth to hit the surface, it's also not been up here on the surface when there were contaminants present. So if you're someone who's afraid of spring water and think it's all contaminated, I'm sorry, just based on the fundamental principles of basic science and <laughs> and I'm not even I'm not even that smart and this is easy for me to figure out. Uh, you're good, okay? That said, go to watercheck.com and get your water tested and make sure it doesn't have any acid rain or any of the funky stuff that you know spring water haters are freaking out about. Uh, also something important to note is that there are, is a lot of commercial water, you know, bottled water, et cetera, that's on the market and labeled as spring water. When technically, if it's water that is pumped from underground aquifers is more like well water, not spring water. So the difference between well water and spring water is that humans need to tap into an aquifer to artificially pump well water. Spring water is pumped by God to the surface of the earth when that water is ripe or that water is ready or that water has been deemed by nature, by the great creator, as being ready to harvest by plants, animals, and homo sapiens like you. Now, some bottled water, like take a brand like Mountain Valley, that's aquifer water or well water. Is that still better than your average tap water? I believe so, but it's nowhere near as good as some really pristine, uh, toxin-free, low TDS spring water. Next up, as for filters, let's get into that for a second. If you don't have access locally to a spring that's low TDS, free of all the nasties, the best filters I've found on the market, and trust me when I say I've researched this to the nth degree, this is at least in the United States. I don't know about worldwide, but I'm from USA, USA. So I'm going to give you this. Uh, there's some guys up in Santa Barbara called O4 Water. I'll be interviewing them soon. They make the most insanely effective and thorough filters. Uh, they also infuse oxygen into their water, which is a very unique practice that I've not seen anyone else do. They make whole house filters. I'm going to warn you, they are not cheap, but they are worth it if you care about your health and you can afford it. They also make under sink filters. And one of my dreams is to have a, an Ophora water whole house filter system on my home. Once I buy my own, I'm not going to do my landlord that expensive favor. But what's awesome about Ophora water is they also make an oxygenated water hot tub that has like pharmaceutically clean water that's then infused with oxygen and becomes kind of a hyperbaric oxygen chamber made of water or what's actually one of those great cedar hot tubs. Now, technically, it's not hyperbaric because there's not pressure, but it's just highly oxygenated water. Uh, when I visit Santa Barbara, I always text my friend Tony <laughs> uh, from that company. and I'm like, dude, can we use the hot tub? And it's just it's just the best ever. I think they're Maybe for the tub and the filters, it's like 30 grand or something. So it's no joke, but um, I'm thinking with an abundance mindset and believing that I deserve and I'm capable of having beautiful things like that. So I'm working my way up to the Ophora water whole house system, the hot tub, the whole deal. Another amazing filter is Pristine Hydro. These guys are based down in Laguna Beach. A genius inventor by the name of Glenn came up with their system. It's insanely cool. It structures the water. It infuses the water with bicarbonate minerals, uh, specifically uh, bicarbonate magnesium, which is what a true beautiful natural spring water in some cases, in some places on Earth would would have in it and it's just again like pharmaceutical grade filtration nothing lame left in it and the water's restructured so both O4 and and pristine hydro essentially what they do is they take tap water from whatever your source is and turn it into a facsimile of spring water it's like making the best spring water you could get in your home so both are very sophisticated systems, very effective. Both of them are available at lukestory.com forward slash store. And I'll be happy if you buy one. I'll get a commission. It'll be awesome. But again, my number one recommendation is just go collect your own spring water every month. Uh, just make sure it's a safe source. Uh, at home, as I said, I drink LiveSpringWater.com. Uh, it's only available again in California right now, unfortunately. But if you find a safe spring near where you live, you can buy 2.5 or 5-gallon glass carboys, which are huge bottles, 
And um, from a home brewing store, by the way, that's where you get those. And you can go collect your own water. Just make sure you keep it covered up away from light as living spring water has life force in it and can actually grow algae if it gets um, sunlight and oxygen. So you want to keep it covered like you would a fine wine in a wine cellar. Again, I'm going to go back and remind you uh, if that water was uh, bit was a handful for you and you're like, whoa, a lot of information. What was that? Uh, do yourself a favor and just go back to episodes 129, 130, and uh, 131, or just download the water guide at lukestory.com forward slash 129. Again, I'm going to repeat this because I know it's hard to write these things down and whatever when you're traveling and listening to my voice. Uh, you can also text the water guide to 44222 on any U.S. phone. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think that wraps up those two questions. You know, it's incredible how much information can be brought up with just two excellent questions in the Facebook group. I'd love to uh, have you join the group. So go to Facebook and search The Lifestylist Podcast. Join the group, join the fun, and make sure to post your questions in there. And I'll do my best to answer them on a future episode. And with that, I'm going to take this moment to sign out.